Hello, sportsmen. You know, July is a great time to catch fish, but you've got to be sharp. Not only mentally sharp, but your hooks have to be sharp, too. Unfortunately, most fishermen keep the hooks in the tackle box about as sharp as they keep the knives in their kitchen drawer at home, and that ain't sharp enough. If you're not convinced, stick around. I'll show you the hows and whys of sharpening hooks and a lot more. I'm Fred Trost with tips on how you can become a more practical sportsman. If it can improve my fishing, there you go. It has a big future in my life. <laughs> <laughs> you know one thing about this lure that is different here. Just put your hand up here. Ho, you, huh? Ho, ho! It's sticking me there. For I it. know that is. Isn't that about the sharpest hooks you've ever Those felt? Nice. Yeah. Mark, how do you do it? How do you sharpen them like this? He has well, a. You've got a diamond hone here. You want to touch them about two to three times. The man honing this hook by hand is Captain Mark Martin, who says sharp hooks helped nearly 75 of his customers last year land Stroh's Award walleye. Losing less fish with sharp hooks is something that caused Bing McClellan from Traverse City to come up with an automated sharpener. Probably takes an average fisherman maybe 30 seconds, a minute maybe, to sharpen a hook. One point. One point on one hook, which mm -hmm. might take you know, five minutes to sharpen all the hooks here, and of course they can easily get damaged on rocks, right. snags. Absolutely. You came up with an invention how to sharpen all these in 30 seconds. Well, it's a, it's a very simple tool. It's called a hook honer, and that's indeed exactly what it is. It hones the hooks rather than, than grinds metal off as, as hones or sharpeners or files type wood. Is this because you, of course, you spend so darn much time fishing? Mm -hmm. And you know sharp hooks are really the key to catching a lot of fish. Well, that's right. That's one of the few things, aside from motherhood, you can't argue about. <laughs> that's right. This little gizmo, interesting, you have the prototype here. Yep. Yep. This, it was developed, what, a year ago? 1987, January 14th was the first time I saw it. Uh, I had commissioned a guy about a year earlier to try to mechanically give me a perfect hook point, mm -hmm. one that is lapped and polished instead of sharpened with a file. You know, the funny thing that, that fishermen don't realize, or anglers, that when you have light line, like two pound test line that I've been fishing with today, yeah. the strength of that knot is probably closer to one pound mm -hmm. than two pounds. So when yeah. you go to set the hook on a fish, you're pulling actually with less than one pound right. of force. Right. And, and even if you're using six pound test, you're probably pulling, mm -hmm. most you can get out of it is two pounds of force. Yeah. Now, how often though, should you really sharpen your hook? Say you catch a fish on it, well, or you get snagged, would you, would you sharpen it every time? No, good heavens, no. How often? I'd just do the thumbnail test every so often during the day I'm oh. fishing. And if it, if it skids on my thumbnail, I touch it up. Now, okay, show me that dude, uh, right. on your thumbnail, okay. how you're gonna. Well, a properly sharpened point, let me get this, thing tuned up here. How hard are you pushing down? Oh, that? not hard at all. You're just holding it in place. There's no... See? That's right. Just There's take, no secret to it, eh? Take, take a minute here. Let's look at this prototype and see what happens inside this. This baby rotates around and buzzes. Yeah, it's lapping the hook point back and forth 300 times a second while it rotates around the hook point three times a second. So put the hook point there where it would be okay, well, if we were sharpening this. All right. And it goes around yeah. like that. It, rota it orbits the hook point. So now you have it sharpened. Now how do you know when it's the way you want it? Well, take your th fingernail or thumbnail, and if you can do that and it doesn't skid off, just barely yep. touch your hook, uh, hook point to your nail, and if it'll stick, it's sharp enough. Stick right there, whoa wee. Yeah, now try one of the other hooks that hasn't been sharpened. Okay, and you can tell by looking at them yeah, that they right. don't have, if they've been sharpened, they're real s silver. Look at that, I can't even get that factory point. Right, right. Well, well that's, that's kind of. That's a brand new Rapala right out of the box. I, I cannot dig that into my fingernail. Mm -hmm. I and can they... scratch with it, and it feels sharp, yeah. And it hurts. And it looks sharp. And it looks sharp, but it doesn't do what this one does, catching on the fingernail. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that. That's why people will buy it, because you can demonstrate oh, the yeah. fact that they'll be more successful. Well, you could well, have fun common just, sense. just tearing your finger up here, seeing how sharp <laughs> that is. Look at my thumbnail from all the shows I did. I almost punctured it. And look at that, really. Out. You have to push real hard to, to get your skin to come up. Oh, you could dig out, you could <laughs> dig out splinters with this. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. 
Well, I'm gonna... I think it has a good future. Oh. It really does. If it can improve my fishing. There you go. It has a big future in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that. Our mutual friend, Emil Dean, ran in some tests on us on a, with a prototype last year. And if there's anything harder to do is because sharp hooks make more importance in downrigger fishing than anything. Oh, yeah, because you're trolling. Because you can't set the hook. Yeah, the fish has to set, set it. Set it for you. Yeah. Yeah. And his hook catch versus line pop-off percentage went up 50% after he sharpened all the hooks. 50%? Hook that makes it 50 You know, I believe it. Uh, when I sharpened just the hook on this lure, mm -hmm. caught two fish in a row, bang, bang. You know, they weren't slipping. Yeah. I think that that does. If it can stick to your stick to your skin, stick to your fingernail, mm -hmm. it's got to stick that much more inside a fish's mouth. Well, it's a very convenient little machine because it's NICAD powered. You recharge from the rear here on the little port. The recharger comes with it. Um, runs about a thousand hook points to charge, so it isn't going to quit on you quick. Once you get out in the boat, you can sharpen mm -hmm. literally a thousand hooks before you have to. to Take her back in, plug her in overnight. You've been you've been to the big fishing tackle trade shows for years. Mm -hmm. I get mail. I get people sending me inventions, some of the goofiest things you've ever seen, mm -hmm. and they're similar in a way to hey, here's the idea that can, you know, yeah, revolutionize right. your fishing. That's the same thing you say about this. Yes. I have yeah. a feeling though this is going to stick. <laughs> That's is... a pretty good pun, besides being yeah, correct. I guess. <laughs> That's right. I think so because it's so basic. In fishing, there's only one thing that is totally, two things that are totally common, water and sharp hooks. Mm -hmm. Because a fisherman literally cannot fish without a hook. He cannot. He can fish fly fishing, he can fish spin casting, he can fish salt water, but he's got to have a hook. He's got to have water. How, how did you... Bing McClellan certainly boils fishing down Around. to the basics. It doesn't matter if you use a battery-powered hook honer or if you use a diamond file to sharpen the points on your fish hooks. Your success will increase if the points are sharp like a surgeon's needle. Mark Martin's success rate proved it, and when Emil Dean started using the battery-powered honer to keep the treble hook sharp on his lures, Emil's loss of fish because of hooking failures dropped in half. A significant lesson to all anglers in Michigan outdoors. Unfortunately, Bing McClellan passed away a few years ago, but he left a lot of inventions for fishing behind him. Now, the hook honer uh, was one that never really took off like he had hoped. It's too bad, though, because most fishermen would catch more fish if their hooks were sharper. And if their knives were sharper, of course, they could fillet the fish they catch easier. Well, at least get a sharp can opener so you can open some canned salmon, because here's a great recipe. Okay, get your creative chef's hat on because we have a unique recipe called Dean's Salmon Burritos. That's right, fish in burritos with a few odd ingredients like broccoli. Cook up a small package and set it aside. Brown a half pound of mushrooms in butter, then add a medium onion which you've chopped up. Brown that. Add a can of Campbell's Cream of Shrimp Soup. The broccoli you've cooked, one cup of shredded cheddar cheese, and a 14-ounce can of pink salmon from the store, or some of your own cooked or canned salmon. Add some garlic powder, dill weed, and pepper to suit your taste. Mix this up and simmer it for about 20 minutes. Warm the burrito skins. Put a couple of tablespoons of this filling inside each one. Roll them up. Top with some cheese and warm until the cheese melts. Oh, this concoction came from Dean Napier from Romulus. It's Dean Salmon Burritos. Very, very tasty. The recipe is in the Outdoor Digest. Every sportsman I know wants to have an outdoor business of some type. I mean, it was my dream when I was a kid. Nothing would be better than to have a sporting goods store. At one time, I wanted to be a taxidermist. Uh, a guide, oh, wouldn't that be great, or a charter captain. Outdoor businesses, if you've been reading uh, the magazine in the past few years and our website, I've done a lot of writing about how the outdoor industry isn't as healthy as it used to be. Everybody wants in the recreational business, and that keeps the prices way down. And it's tough to make a buck, but there's a business, a brand new industry, and we don't see a lot of these in the outdoors, but here it is. I'm standing in front of the sign here, Yoder's North American Live Big Game Shows. Now, we're not talking about like a game show, uh, Jeopardy and all that stuff. Elk, Mule Deer, Whitetails, Bill and Kelly Yoder from Clarksville, Michigan. And here's the man, Bill Yoder, who 
what is a live big game show? Does, when we were kids, I didn't know anything about this. Well, this started kind of as a hobby. And I'm the only one in Michigan doing this. So it just, I like to enjoy animals. So I'm raising the deer and the elk and the mule deer just for something different and let everybody else enjoy them. Well, the live big game shows though, you just don't have people come here like a zoo. No. I mean, this isn't a place, I don't see a ticket booth, I don't right. see popcorn and all that. This is not Pe a, an people animal do. world. No, people do come here. I have a USDA license, so I can have people here anytime, and, and I can travel all through the United States. But I do go to shows, I get paid to go to shows, so people draw people in. And people come to see these three things? You take elk, mule deer, and whitetail? Right. Yeah. Right now we don't have an elk right here, but we will have as soon as they're born. But, they but like we do take, yeah, we will have them at, hopefully at the fair, and we'll have red deer too. I'm getting into red deer too. Now how do you, how do you take these animals around? I load them into my trailer, and I don't have to tranquilize them, and they're so tame. They love going to the shows. They walk right in the trailer, like, you know, like it's fun. They enjoy it. They like the attention. Only certain bucks will do that. And it's like people, they gotta enjoy what they're doing to do it. Otherwise, they won't go on. You can't drive a deer like you can cattle. You know, if you could, you'd, everybody would get them and shoot them in the wild. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing, uh, that when you take animals like this around where there's crowds, these are wild animals. You can't take the wild out of a white tail, you can you? No, you cannot. You cannot take it out, them, but they gotta like people and the noise. I've been set up right next to railroad tracks and trains blowing there. Like at Anderson Archery, the trains go through there all the time and it doesn't even bother them. But it takes a certain animal to do that. Now, how do you, how do you get those animals? You don't buy them that way. You, you have to work with them. You raise them when they're little. We usually start raising them at five days old, bottle feeding. And, but like I say, one out of five will be that good natured. The other four, I usually try to get rid of them. Oh, really? Yeah. So you have to sort through. You have to, yep. Yeah, it's like a good puppy in the litter. Some are going to be better than others. and. It's just how it is, it, you know, they're all different. How did you get onto this? First of all, the idea that people would pay to see a traveling wild animal zoo. Well, I seen somebody else do it and then I knew there was nobody in this area that did it. So I wanted to have, and he only has white tails and I wanted to have a variety. Most people never even see a mule deer unless they go west or something. So it's just something different, you know, and I enjoy the heck out of it, you know. Now, do you do this year round? I try to, yes, I do, yeah. Here, buddy. Except during a rut, it's a little well, rough. Yeah, I was gonna <laughs> say, during, when, do, when does it start that, that you can't load the bucks well, into the trailer? about the 8th or 10th of October is about the last time you wanna put them on. It's kinda rough after that. What about the winter shows? Do you do this in the winter? Yeah, I, um, I had one buck carry his antlers to April 1st, so I'm gonna try to get more booked this year. I have quite a few booked in the winter time. Now, when is it, though, that they calm down enough? That well, they can... really don't calm down. They lose their antlers. It's just a chance. You know, I have more help here now to load them when I do that. It, it kind of intimidates them. When I do it by myself, they're not, they're used to me and they're not afraid of me. But if I have three or four people, it kind of intimidates them so they go on better. But now, it, th these, these bucks that you take around are not ones that people can pet, are No, they? The, the Michigan laws and most of the state laws, you cannot touch them. They still have to use that. USD license is four foot away like a zoo. You have a four foot difference between that and the cage or pen, whatever they're in. So they stay right in that trailer. Yeah. What, uh, if you don't mind me asking, what this must cost a chunk of change yes. to, to put this together. What, what's the trailer cost? The trailer's 22,000 and the truck's around 15 to 20,000. So it's quite a bit. The trailer's all air conditioned, insulated, heated. Right. So. You know, people can't say they don't have it. They got better than most people in that trailer. It is nice in there. Well, what about the deer? I mean, you have two, two factors. One, you got a, do you buy many deer? Do you breed them or what? I breed, I got a few, two does is all I have, but I breed a few, but I try to buy a different buck fawn every year so I have some different bloodlines. And if they work out, good. If they don't, you know, I got to keep doing it to increase my herd and better bloodlines. What, what is a, what is a, a, a buck cost? A buck fawn usually runs 250 to $500. And then what about, you say you have to get rid of some of the bigger ones right. so they get surly? And a good buck scores in 160 class go for 4500 right around no that area. No yep. $4,000 yep. people will pay? They sure do. To put them out on preserves yep. and then and get that, yep. that or, or do they get that kind of breeding? And they use a breed them or they'll, whatever they pays the most money. Wow. Yeah. Have you been approached by the people? Uh, we always hear about the Asian market and the antlers and the aphrodisiacs and all. The elk elk market is better. They tried selling velvet off whitetails and it's not a high quality velvet. 
the elk is a lot better velvet. Does it work? It, well, they say it does. <laughs> I've tried it you for have? my injuries, and it, I didn't think it worked. Now, hold well. it. For your injuries? Yes. Well, what for were, my, that, my, that, That's a different story. Yeah, it's a different story. <laughs> but uh, I see. Well, we'll just get into that story another time. Okay. But the, so the money that you make in this business, the North American Big Game Shows, is from people paying you to go around right. and display. To draw people in, right. And it's, and I enjoy it, really enjoy it, to talk to people and see people. And kids and big kids get a kick out of seeing, you know, something they don't see every day. Big kids, you mean like up Adults. to what, 70 years yeah. old? So, as long as they're still alive, they're big kids, yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, Bill, look forward to having you at the fair. Yeah. Interesting story on big game shows, a new element, a new business. I don't think there's room for a lot of people in it, and it's a high investment, but Bill Yoder has it, has the animals. Uh, an interesting twist in the outdoor industry in the 1990s. Bill Yoder will be at the Outdoor Fair the weekend of the 18th and 19th in Brighton, and next week on this show, Bill will tell you the story of one of his bucks that gored him so severely last November that he was hospitalized for three and a half months. That's next week. The Outdoor Fair is a two-day event, Saturday and Sunday, July 18th and 19th at the Livingston Conservation and Sports Association in Brighton. Now, that's on the north side of Brighton, a few miles, not hard to find. It opens both days at 9 a.m. You'll find a number of activities open all day, both days, like Puppy Alley. Folks who have sporting dog puppies for sale will set up under the shade trees on the trail into the fair. And a lot of families will leave the fair with new family members. Other displays that will be open all weekend include deer camps. You can walk through the various tent camps we've used over the years and walk through the pickup camper we'll be using this year. And several other hunter groups will also set up their deer camps as well. If you have a tent camp or a novel type of deer camp that you'd like to display, please give us a call. We'd like to have you in our deer camp demonstration area. Now, speaking of deer... Bill Yoder's live wild game show will have several trophy bucks, mule deer, white-tail deer, and an elk. By July 18th, the antlers will be a lot larger than you see right here. Of course, there's the exhibitor's tent with fishing and hunting equipment suppliers, organizations serving sportsmen. If you're a bow hunter, be sure to bring your bow. The 30-target 3D course will be open during the entire fair. It's a scenic course through the woods with a variety of challenging targets. The shooting shows have been a highlight of some of our fairs uh, in years past. We're bringing them back, featuring Harry Reinfelder and his trick shooting. The handgun show is at 11 a.m. each day, featuring demonstrations of tiny pocket pistols, revolvers, semi-autos, and big-bore handguns. We'll also demonstrate safety and talk a little bit about handgun laws. At 12.30, the shotgun show will feature Harry's trick shooting and will demonstrate various shotguns, loads, and targets. At 2 o'clock, the rifle show will trace the development of rifles from muzzleloaders to modern assault weapons. I just learned that Harry Reinfelder will be bringing machine guns. He'll demonstrate the pitfalls of machine guns and the misconceptions that automatic weapons uh, are portrayed in the movies. Saturday at 3.30, we'll do an archery show comparing the performance of longbows, recurves, compounds, and crossbows. Dominic Troya and his muzzle-loading cannon will be a part of the rifle show, so he'll also be doing cannon demonstrations at 11.30 and 1.30 both days. Now, Saturday at 11 will be the Northern International Regional and the Lake Michigan Regional Sanctioned Duck Calling Contests. Seminars by outdoor experts will be going on all the time. Mark Raymond will demonstrate pointing dog training at noon and 4. At 1.30, he'll talk about using pointers to blood trail deer. Bob and Alice Steiner will demonstrate retriever training at 11, 12, 30, and 3. Other seminars include Professor Fens on fishing, Kevin Cray on deer scents and mock scrapes, Bill Yoder on raising deer, Todd Aloffs on duck and goose calling, the Michigan Lyme Disease Foundation and the Great Lakes Ferret Association and Bird's Eye Production will be demonstrating the blimp they use for taking pictures from the air. And there's a schedule for archery novelty shoots, including the 100-yard-plus Old Riz Long Shot. And there's the bionic targets 
And the Fun Clays range will be open periodically if you'd like to bring your shotgun or borrow a shotgun and try clay target shooting. Now, wait a minute. Lots going on at the fair. Next week, I'll introduce you to the new shooting ranges at the club, give you a last-minute rundown of the attractions with the people who will be putting them on. Perch have been spotty, but nice fish, 8 to 14 inches. We showed you some footage last week. I mean, take a look at the footage. Take a look at these, the, the perch that we caught when we were there a week ago. I mean, those are dandy perch. There, were, there was one or two up to 15 inches. So, you know, you don't need to catch a lot of them when you're catching them that size. They're also getting Scamania steelhead off the pier. The outdoor fair comes up next weekend. It's your chance to meet uh, some of the people that you've seen on the show, the crew on the show, see the equipment that we use. Uh, the next week, I'm going to give you a final rundown of the activities and the times and the events we're going to have at the fair. In the meantime, make sure you get outdoors. Hey, at the first part of July here, it's a great place to be. See you next week. Seven pounds, two ounces, 24 inches long, one of the larger largemouth bass that That's we good. see. Yes, sir. So, you don't want to tell about the lake. This is Arnold. But you will talk about the fish. Arnold, why yeah. is it Arnold? Arnold the pig? His cousin was Arnold Ziffel. He's a hog. He is a hog. What was it like to catch a seven-pound largemouth? Well, um, I've caught several fish um, that were close to him, but uh, this fish we got out, and uh, I cast it up into about eight foot of water into the weeds. I was sitting in 25, and I started pulling my jig through the weeds and I got him loose on the edge on the weed line and the jig started falling and next thing I know he was sitting right there waiting for it. Mm. Grabbed that jig and he was going for 25 foot of water. Are he, you a tournament fisherman? I have fish tournaments. Um, I'm actually, I, I like to hunt trophies and this is what I, um, I've been successful at. Um, the fish, when he grabbed my jig and started going for the deep water, he started turning the front of the boat. We were facing north when it started. When we were done, we were facing south. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked down in the water, and you can see how wide the fish's back is. Oh, yeah. Tip, tip him right up there. We'll show you any, how. Any, uh, anybody here who's caught a big muskie or a pike knows that the big wide back when they see that, they know they got a big fish on. Well, I looked down in the water, we didn't know what it was. And I saw this big wide back and I said, it's a big pike. And it was cloudy, you couldn't see his whole body. And so my buddy grabs the net and the next thing you know, he says, that's not a pike, it's a bass. Oh, yeah. So to mistake a, ba a bass for a big pike is a uh, big thing. You betcha, well you'll be back at that unnamed lake this year, eh? Oh yes, sir. Congratulations, Chris Collier from Waterford.